Right. Uh, welcome to this panel. Uh, it's my great pleasure and uh, privilege to moderate in the panel honoring Francis Molino, Jury, um, pioneering Franco-Jewish Sephardic history, celebrating the scholarship of Francis Molino, a great colleague, friend, distinguished scholar. Um, I'm a, as I said, I'm Aaron Rodriguez. I teach at Stanford University, and I will introduce in uh, uh, the order of presentations uh, the panelists. Uh, first, Robin Judd, who is Associate Professor of History at Ohio State University. She's published many articles and is the author uh, many articles and is the author of the book Contested Rituals. Circumcision, Kosher Butchering, and German Jewish Political Life, 1843 to 1933. She's currently working on another book on love, liberation, and loss, Jewish brides, soldier husbands, and rebuilding Jewish life after the Holocaust. She's currently serving as vice president for publications at the Association for Jewish Studies. Then Lisa Leff will speak. She is professor of history at American University, and as of 2019, the incoming director of the Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. She, she's the author of numerous articles and two books, Sacred Bonds of Solidarity, The Rise of Jewish Internationalism in 19th Century France, and also The Archive Thief, The Man Who Salvaged French Jewish History in the Wake of the Holocaust, which was awarded the 2016 Sami Rohr Prize in Jewish Literature. Then we'll speak. Alma Rachel Heckman is the Neufeld Levin Chair of Holocaust Studies and Assistant Professor of History and Jewish Studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She specializes in modern Jewish history of North Africa and the Middle East with an interest in citizenship, the politics of belonging, transnationalism, and the empire. She is currently at work on a book manuscript tentatively entitled Radical Nationalists, Moroccan Jewish Communist Nationalisms and the politics of belonging. She's also editing a volume regarding Jews and radicalism in comparative frameworks. And um, Sarah Stein, it, Sarah Abravaya Stein, is professor of history, Memoris Amado chair in Sephardic studies at UCLA, and Sadie and Ludwig Kahn, director of UCLA Center for Jewish Studies. Former Guggenheim fellow, her many award-winning books include Extraterritorial Dreams, European Citizenship, Sephardi Jews, and the Ottoman 20th Century, and Saharan Jews, and the Fate of French Algeria. She has edited several books and other books and written uh, other books and numerous, she has numerous publications. She's now completing a history that traces the story of a single Sephardic family across the globe uh, and the arc of the 20th century for Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux Macmillan publishers. So, Robin. So one striking characteristic of academia concerns the nature of lineage. Part of a shalshalat hakabalah, a train of tradition, our teachers stamp their influence on our writing, our speaking, our teaching. Usually, we frame this influence by focusing on our graduate work. Just consider the implication of the term Dr. Fater. But for some of us who have been fortunate enough to have been trained by exceptional graduate and undergraduate mentors, this train of tradition is nuanced by the influences imprinted by strong undergraduate scholar teachers. To that end, permit me to begin with the moment that Fran evoked last April when she commenced her wonderful address, Jewish Voices, Muslim Lands. That is her inaugural lecture, which she gave nearly 30 years ago. I lack the technology to show the clip that Fran shared, but I can set the scene in part because I was an enthusiastic Wellesley senior at the time. In an unrenovated Jewett hall, Wellesley's president and provost outlined the significance of Jewish studies and the importance of the gift. After an introduction from the college president and then an incredible charge by Rabbi Molino, Fran's father, Fran, clad in a shockingly bold green suit, introduced an auditorium filled of people to the field of Jewish studies. I had promised my totally hesitant roommates that it would be a significant moment in our lives as Wellesley women, and it really was. 
I use these two moments, last spring's lecture and the inaugural of 1990, as devices to introduce some of Fran's many influences, to talk about the ways in which she has woven her students into the train of tradition to which she had been integrated by her teachers, but also to consider how Fran has integrated us into new tapestries that she and others of her generation have helped to create. Fran's style as a mentor and institutional partner are inexorably linked with some of the markers of her scholarship, scholarship that she walked us through holistically in an earlier iteration in 1990 and then again last year. With her study of the Sephardic Jews of Bordeaux, transitioning to her wonderful biography of Zalkin Horowitz, moving into her insightful work on the teachers of the Alliance, and physically transporting us to forgotten and lesser known Jewish communities via her work in the digital humanities, Fran has demonstrated a keen ability to identify silences and absences, sympathetically observe the nuanced identities and affiliations people create with institutions and places, and wonderfully tease out the ways in which individual circumstances, interactions of familial relationships, economic cycles and structures of knowledge are inherently gendered. That facility to locate absences, to understand the vagaries of human connections, to unpack relationships with places real or imagined, and to use gender as a prism through which one sees the world, inform her serious work as an institutional partner, scholar, teacher, mentor, and visionary. Consider, for example, the legacy she will leave behind at Wellesley. As the Sophia Moses Robison Professor of Jewish Studies, Fran built upon a few extant offerings in Jewish studies to create and curate a rich program with faculty from across the college. A sympathetic and acute observer of people and the institutions with which they create allegiances, Fran quickly demonstrated a nuanced understanding of the landscape. She identified new partners and allies while cementing relationships with those who had already been teaching Jewish studies. She moved Jewish studies from the margins to the center of academic life. She did so by co-sponsoring dozens and dozens of programs and by launching her own programs that would have national and international implications, such as the conference celebrating the anniversary of Jewish studies at Wellesley, which invited Jewish female authors from around the world. Fran also helped to deepen and expand course offerings because she effectively integrated her nuanced understanding of the institution and its students while simultaneously tapping into some of her own larger research questions. Her first year seminar on Roots of Exile, which examines Jews and Muslims living in North Africa and the Middle East, and her upper level seminar comparing Zionism with Irish nationalism, introduce students to the possibility of using Jewish studies as a way to ask larger questions about the definition of community, belonging, ideology, and homeland. Her brilliance as an institutional partner has its roots in her deep understanding of how history and historical memory works with an institution. That we're taping today's session is a case in point. Fran understands that today's panel is also important for Wellesley and its history of Jewish studies. Just like today, she has worked to capture and document moments that are important to Wellesley's history and to the history of Jewish studies at the institution. Moreover, her deep sensitivity to history, absence, community, and connections has helped propel, propel her to create Diarna, a digital mapping geo-museum that has digitally preserved the physical remnants of Jewish communities from across the world and it too has wide-ranging institutional partners. Finally, Fran's acute understanding of personal relationships, her focus on place and space, and her nuanced utilization of gender as a prism with which she reads the world characterize her role as a mentor. I know that many of us in this room have benefited from Fran's mentoring, and I imagine that each of us would identify our own markers. Let me share mine. Fran lives and acts as she studies and teaches. She deeply values her relationships with others, with institutions, and with places, 
and she encourages her students and mentees to place values on their relationships as well. What a remarkable thing it was for me as a college senior to watch Fran as a new chair introduce and thank her family, her parents, her children, her spouse. In 1990, the opportunity for us to see female academics juggling these many responsibilities were few and far between. Fran has made it clear to us how much she values the relationships in her life, and she's encouraged us to value those relationships as well. And yet, another attribute of Fran's mentoring has been her acknowledgement and reification of the difficulty of being a female academic, of her recognition that just because one is capable of many things does not really mean that one can do or have it all. I have really valued the moments of strength and vulnerability that she has shared with me and the other people that she mentors. Fran has encouraged us to be real women and not to always strive for being wonder women. And finally, Fran offers a unique ability to make each and every one of us feel as if we are the most important individual in her world. And at that time, we really are. She devotes countless hours to the many people she mentors, and she has the amazing ability to lift up while also holding up to high standards and possibilities. She is a connector, linking former students and mentees with one another and with the many individuals in her world. To conclude, in 1932, Fran's soon-to-be Alliance teachers wrote essays on the topic of memory and leaving home. Sound familiar? Fran's 2008 article on Sephardic adolescent identities brilliantly portrays the lessons she took away from what happened when these young women from eight different countries were asked to contemplate their homes for one last time. Assume the question posed, that before leaving your country for a number of years, you contemplate your dwelling one last time and note your impressions. Describe briefly the house, the principal events that it brings to mind, the feelings that attach you to it, and what its memory will be from now on in your life. When I first read that article, I couldn't help but think about how much the entrance exam must have resonated with Fran, someone who is so sensitive to the feelings and memories of others, and someone who has dedicated her career to helping those who leave their homes for college do this hard work of forging identities and creating relationships with people and places. When I returned to this article last week in advance of writing this paper, Fran, I thought about your former office in Founders Hall. And the feelings so many of us have about that space, despite its allergens and mold and peeling paint. <laughs> about the events it brings to mind and the place in our historical memories that it continues to serve. I, for one, am so grateful that you opened up your office, your mind and your heart, to me and to countless other students like me. We have benefited so much from the many tapestries you have helped to weave, and I'm so very grateful. It's an honor to be here today to discuss your work, Fran. Um, and the focus of my contribution today is about uh, Fran Molino's work uh, in modern French Jewish history. Um, now, as you may know, this field, it's unimaginable, but it used to be a lonely outpost that very few people worked in, not the booming dynamic field that it now is. Um, but seriously, actually, um, this field was really uh, considered quite marginal for two reasons, right? Jewish studies was much more concerned with earlier periods or more densely populated areas, even for modern history. And of course, in French history, Jews were completely invisible, right? So the reason why we still may be small, but we are certainly not lonely, and I think the work we do is recognized as quite important is because those things have truly shifted. And um, I want to describe Fran's work, and what I want to get across is how important she has been as a scholar in moving this so that we understand how important French Jews are, both to Jewish studies and to French history. So to kind of go through, I mean, these books have already been mentioned by Robin, but to kind of go through what they argue um, in order to show you how, uh, how this work makes French Jewish history central. Um, the first book was based on her dissertation, of course, on the Sephardic Jews of Bordeaux. 
And it show, and I have to just uh, interrupt myself for a moment to say what a pleasure it was in the last few weeks to go and get these books off my shelf and actually reread them and see how fresh and important they still are. The Sephardic Jews of Bordeaux argues that um, the path to Jewish emancipation of, in France, the stress on Jews' utility, right, was forged first by the Sephardim. And one of the things that remains so fresh and important about this book is that it says, like when I think like 1978 this book came out, it says that this path was forged before the revolution, right? And in this way, um, it uh, kind of foreshadows what happened in uh, French revolutionary studies afterwards, which is pushing back the time frame, right? Making us think about the pre-revolutionary period. And then of course, in Jewish studies, um, thinking about the importance of the Sephardim, or, you know, uh, who are a tiny minority, as very, um, very central. And the, these, both of these insights remain very important. Then in her second book, um, the book on Zalkin Horowitz, a Jew in the French Revolution, she expands this contribution to looking at the experience of Jews in the Revolution through um, from a different point of view, right? So here she set herself the task of writing a biography um, of a Polish Jew who lived in Paris at the time of the revolution. He was not rich. He was not prominent in any traditional sense. He left behind practically nothing. And we know from the book an exact list of what he left behind. And one of the things he did not leave behind was any picture, right? We don't know what he looked like. And yet she chooses this man to write a biography of. So, so quite an ambitious task. The reason why she chose him and the reason why so many students already knew of him and why we love him so much today is, of course, he's one of the three co-winners of the 1787 Metz essay contest on making the Jews more useful and happy in France. And every student who's ever heard of this essay contest always gravitates towards his essay because famously he reversed the terms of the question. He is someone who unapologetically thought Jews didn't need to change in order to become French. But what's great about this book is not only this kind of focus on an unapologetic um, author of a Jewish apology, um, but also what she does with it. Because part of what uh, Fran Molino's contribution is is to always be speaking to both French history and to Jewish history. So from a, from, a, from a French history perspective, what's brilliant in this book is that it's not just the biography of a Jew. It's using the story of this Jew as a lens through which to understand what the revolution was, right? Both its the hopes that one could have for it and the disappointments and then also the, the possibilities that it opened up. So no simple narrative. But think about that move in a French history that had so long ignored even the presence of Jews to say, let's tell the story of the revolution through the lens of a Jew. And then now, of course, she's been at work on a series of studies, uh, eventually to be a book, on the women teachers of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, woman after woman involved in uh, teaching for this institution, born in one part of the Jewish world, trained in France to become teachers, and then often going to spend their careers in, in yet another place. And I wondered to myself, does this book and these studies, do they belong in my contribution today? Because are they French? And of course, this is part of the point of the contribution here. They may not have been French citizens, but their interaction with France was powerful. It's part of that greater France, right, that, that the Alliance imagined uh, that we so often ignore. And of course, again, through the experiences of particular Jewish people, she's showing us a different vision of what France meant. I also want to um, take a moment to talk about another way that Fran contributed to French Jewish history. She put together, she's very well known for having put together a couple of edited volumes. And one of them, the 1985 Jews of Modern France edited volume, is one of the things actually we most associate with her. So I thought it was really important to bring it up today and to think about why this book is so important and what Fran's particular contribution to it was. Because I think it tells us something about 
what it means to contribute to scholarship. Now this volume, as some of you probably already know, I think probably everyone knows, um, grew out of a conference that I believe was organized in 1983, okay, in, in 1983 at Brandeis. And the resulting volume, if you look at the table of contents, it includes essays, essays by so many of the greats. Um, so uh, Michelle Abitbol, Pierre Birnbaum, Nancy Green, uh, Patrice Higonet, Paula Hyman, David Landis, Michael Maris, Zev Sternhau, Shmuel Trigano, Eugen Weber, Georges Vale. You know, it's like people from such different places, intellectually, geographically. And I've heard stories from Fran about some of the preparatory work that went into making this conference happen. You know, you go back to imagine an era before the internet. How do you do that transatlantic cajoling, right, <laughs> that you have to do to make a conference happen? And she did it, of course, with letters, um, building on relationships. Too often in academia, we underestimate the work it takes to do things like that, the personal work, the work of friendship, the work of graciousness, the work of hosting, um, the very personal work. And I think that's because we consider it an innate personality characteristic. And I think any of us who know Fran know that she does have that personality characteristic. But I think we need to go beyond just it's part of a person and uh, recognize that it's also work. And it's a work that too often goes unrecognized. And I want to just take a moment to kind of think about that, right? It comes easily to Fran. But what does it result in that she is kind of a magnetic personality, a person that you love, a person that you trust? and think of as a host, and you're willing to fly across the ocean, right, to go and see her. What it meant for this conference is that it brought together people from Israel, from France, from the United States to have a conversation that they had not been having. And of course, this was a propitious moment when such a conversation was possible. It was a conversation that was possible in France because in the 1980s, people had begun to question the revolution in new ways, so some people were thinking this had always been thought of in certain terms, now they're going to rethink it. It's a certain moment in the history of the Vichy syndrome. Uh, it's a certain moment when Jews are willing to question long-held truths about emancipation. But what Fran did that was so brilliant that's beyond timing is to say, let's put all those conversations in conversation with each other. right? Many of us have tried in the intervening decades to stage such a conference, I think, and I'm among them, to say, like, let's get us all together in French Jewish history and have something that's as great and as dynamic and as truly, um, someone once described this conference to me as embattled, you know, like people really were engaged and really had deep conversations. And, um, you know, I think a lot of good has come out of those attempts, but nothing has quite captured this. Um, what this volume is, and that's why it remains always still a classic. It's that ability to see what conversations are happening and how they're far apart from one another and to bring them together, and that's what she was able to do. I want to end by on themes that I see from my review of, uh, of Fran's work. Um, what I see is a, a, the, her contributing across all of these many different projects that I looked at again with such pleasure. One of the contributions is to always look at Jewish context and French context together, uh, treating both contexts as equally interesting and equally important, that we must put them in conversation. Second, um, French Jews just don't just live in the hexagon. We must look at France as a transnational space or including people living transnationally. And she's doing this in the 1960s and 70s already, right? We're not, this isn't just, um, she's not following others. She's really a pathbreaker here. And she really has urged us all to think in these terms. And this, this, her current work on the Alliance teachers is just the latest iteration of this. Third theme, and I've taken this so much to heart, um, people matter. When you look at history from the point of view of actual individuals, that's where you see the real thing. So, you know, from her essay on Furtado from many years ago, to her book on Horowitz, to her, um, her fabulous rendition of Bigart, 
um, to the women teachers of the Alliance, like Hasiba Ben Shimon, who really come to life. Part of this is transhumanism, right, which Robin's already talked about. But some of it is actually um, the core of her independent, um, her independent-minded approach to history. I want to end with a, this, uh, just from the introduction to the Zalkin Horowitz book, which I think kind of tells us why she thinks it's important to look at individuals, she says. She's trying to convince the reader to read the book. So she says, <laughs> why take this journey, she writes. Through the experience of this one individual, we can better understand the revolution, Jewish emancipation, the ambiguities of a new post-revolutionary Jewish identity. And because this minor hero in a turbulent age defies and contests the clarity of teleological history, it's about breaking apart long accepted teleologies, right? That's what she's demanding that we do. That, and that's teleologies from Marxism or from Jewish history or the emancipatory narrative. And she asks us to do that by holding on to individuals and recognizing the complexity of the world as they lived it, right? And this is what I found the most inspiring. So thank you for your work, Fran. for me to think about what exactly to say in this context um, because it is kind of a meta pleasure to be speaking in this forum. Um, I was a student of Franz at Wellesley College. I graduated in 2009 and when I first met Fran in the context of one of her courses, Jews of Muslim Lands, in I think it was the fall of 2007, I had no idea of what AJS was or what Jewish studies would have to say as a career or any of these sorts of things. And in fact, I took her class as a Middle Eastern studies major and the timing was convenient and it was a subject I knew absolutely nothing about and it would fulfill my major. Um, and I had no idea at the time that this would be sort of a fateful, life-changing class, actually, to be sitting in that room. Um, and, you know, 10 years later, here I am wanting to speak about an extended thank you note, essentially, to Fran and all of that she has done. Um, and I was just thinking, right before coming to this particular panel, there have been a round of conversations about Jewish, Sephardic Jewish pedagogy and what that means within comparison to Ashkenazi studies. And I was just thinking about what an absolute rarity and privilege it was that my very first exposure to Jewish studies as a field was not through some standard narrative of Ashkenazi normative historiography, um, but it was, in fact, through this very unique combination that Fran's research and teaching embodies and that she has passed on to so many of us that she has mentored. and. It's Jewish studies, but it's French empire, and it's Middle Eastern studies, and it's Zionism, and it's Irish nationalism. It's all of these transnational and thematic connections that go so far above and beyond any one discipline. Jewish studies included, but French, French empire, North African historiography, any of these things. Um, and her courses, of course, reflect this. She had a class in anti-Semitism. She had the Irish nationalism and Zionism class, Roots of Exile. And I think I only actually took one class with Fran. It dawns on me. And that is that Jews of Muslim lands class. But that was so, so formative. Um, and her teaching within those classes, just like the transnational scope, was highly creative. I was trying to remember some of the assignments that we had in those classes. I mean, I still use many of the texts in my own teaching that Fran introduced me to, the frameworks that Fran introduced me to. Um, and she gave this wonderful assignment, I remember, of a creative writing assignment, actually, and speaking about the human and the humanity in her research and the importance of these individuals. I remember Fran had us, uh, when we were just starting to learn about the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which is also something I had no idea about existing before this class, and she had us write a sort of first-person narrative um, as somebody going to an Alliance school. 
and what their day might be like and what their conversations at home might be like and what their life in the street might be like and really engendering that deep empathy that I think is the goal of so many excellent scholarly works but bringing that into her teaching as well so not only her writing into her teaching and trying to impart that empathy that we can gain from historical research into an assignment for an undergraduate class and I can only imagine all the papers you read in retrospect <laughs> um, I did not read my own again because I was afraid of it um, but in addition to that sort of formal um, more formal classwork she had all of these other mentorship roles within my life alone. I think she won a mentorship award earlier this morning. I don't know if that was mentioned earlier. Um, but because she has done this work with so many of us, um, she is one of the founders of the Diarna project um, that was just getting off the ground when I was at Wellesley, mapping Jewish history across North Africa and the Middle East, and really ahead of the curve of digital humanities and digital Jewish studies. Uh, maybe I just wasn't part of those conversations at the time in the same way, but it seems only recently that that's become a field unto itself, and this was really pioneering stuff in 2008, I think it was when I first learning about it from you, and at this point so many generations of Wellesley students have worked with Fran and worked with Jason, who is also in the audience today, on um, Diarna and learning to not only think about the Jewish past, but map it visually, engage with it in a digital humanities project um, that goes far beyond um, just academic work. In addition to that Diarno work, um, I had the privilege of working with Fran and another guise of an internship at the Hadassah Brandeis Institute. And again, this was all while I was a Middle Eastern Studies major. I was not a Jewish Studies major at all at Wellesley. Um, and it was in that capacity. I was doing research for Fran and learning about her teachers and the world that she was building in her research. And Fran, back to that theme of the deeply human, Fran knew absolutely everything about the Benchamol family. She could tell me about their letters to each other. She could tell me about their eventual causes of death. Um, she could tell me about their problems within teaching in Tetuan and elsewhere and the ultimate tragic transfer to Libya and all of these sorts of details um, that has really affected my own approach to thinking about writing history as humanly driven, as character driven, in that fundamental um, humanistic manner. Um, so it's hard for me to summarize even these thoughts because again, I was thinking of this as a thank you letter in many, many ways, but um, I mean, we co-wrote an article together, right? What undergraduate gets the opportunity to co-author an article with a faculty member? And that's not meant to like reflect well on me. That's meant to reflect really well on. <laughs> it's meant to reflect well on Fran, right? That she. I mean, that takes a lot of time. I did not know anything about doing that kind of research. I messed up entirely the first time I was in the archive. I did not know what I was doing whatsoever. <laughs> and um, Fran extraordinarily patiently worked with me in this. Um, and I don't know if I fully appreciated it at the time, but she really ushered me into this profession and thinking about historical writing in these ways and what it means to work in the archive. And the history of the Alliance as an archival space itself um, from such a delicate and nuanced perspective in all of these particular ways. And she, I mean, she retired this past summer, but she continues to do all of these things. And I think I've heard her discuss like 20 new projects just this morning. Um, so um, there's still a lot more to come. Um, so I think I'll just kind of conclude as a thank you and as looking forward to seeing what future work Fran engages in and building on all of these themes. Um, and really, again, just a very sincere thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and to honor your work, Fran, and to um, hear your uh, colleagues and, and former students and, um, and friends speak about your work and your impact. Um, I was not a student 
of Franz, um, was not a student at Wellesley, but I received my PhD um, from an institution where I had two beloved mentors, Aaron is one, both um, wonderful, and but also both men. And I um, did not have a, a chair who, um, or a co-chair who was a, a woman colleague, and much in the way that Robin, I think, described, it was so important for me to come of age not only with models of women leaders in the field like Fran and, and some others, but the list was not terribly long when I uh, received my degree, but to begin to, to know Fran not only as a student but as a colleague. And she very graciously um, took me, along with many other, I should say, junior women colleague under her wing, um, and I think um, became, I became something of a, of a stepchild, as it were, uh, only in time to inherit a child of her own, in a sense, uh, because Alma, having been a friend's student as an undergraduate, became my student as a graduate student. Um, and I want to also, by way of beginning, echo um, a point that Lisa raised, which is that mentorship takes a great deal of generosity and empathy. Um, and modeling, but it is also labor, and it is the labor that creates community, um, intellectual courage, uh, and um, it is a form of professionalization. And the, the mentoring that women in this field, and of course in many other fields, have done for junior women is so often unrecognizable labor, certainly not labor that one gets formal credit for, but is so uh, very essential in encouraging um, women scholars. Now, we had divvied up roles for one another here, and you've heard uh, Robin speak a bit about uh, Fran and the Wellesley community and the, the founding of, of the, ch of the uh, program and the chair, and you've heard Lisa speak about the field of French history and Alma speak about the experience of being a student, and I wanted to speak a bit about Fran's impact, but really um, presaging of the field of Sephardic studies. Uh, and there will be a little bit of overlap with what has already been said. Um, like Lisa, I had the pleasure of reviewing um, much of Fran's work in the last couple of weeks. And one of the things I found myself doing was puzzling over the footnotes of um, Sephardic Jews of Bordeaux. Now, this was incredibly instructive to me, because I realize in reviewing her source base how slender was the historiography at that time on so of so many of the fields that you were contributing to uh, scholarship on the western sephardim uh, scholarship on the revolutionary moment um, scholarship on uh, french jewry Looking at those footnotes, we can see that Arthur Hertzberg's book had been published, uh, The French Enlightenment and the Jews, had been published about a decade earlier, that um, Zosa Tsaikovsky had published a number of articles, and I.S. Riva on Murano's in France, as, as the terminology was in place at the moment. But there was really no real historiographic conversation about Sephardic Jews in Europe, in France, Jews' relationship to the macro processes affecting Europe, emancipation, liberalism, state building, and also um, no real deep conversation yet about assimilation as a phenomenon. There would be soon, of course. Fran, in some ways, this book be represents the cresting of a wave. But looking at the footnotes, it's clear that this was a very pioneering scholarly effort in all of these domains. And now it is astonishing to consider that the attention lavished on the French Revolution that would come a good 15 years later, not by Jewish historians. Now I'm thinking of scholars like Lynn Hunt, Keith Baker, Sarah Maza, others. It's not really my field, but um, it was so many years in the making still as was the literature on Western Sephardim. Now, Sephardic studies itself actually wasn't a field at that moment. Uh, and it would also take some years, I think, before there was, and we were speaking in an earlier panel about the creation of the Sephardic Mizrahi Caucus 20 years ago, but that was after this book was published. Um, I see 
in Assimilation and Emancipation in, Revol in uh, the Sephardic Jews of Bordeaux, this book, Assimilation and Emancipation in Revolutionary Napoleonic France, as I said before, presaging of some of the arguments that will continue to be essential to scholars of Sephardic Jewry. Lisa had elaborated upon some of the central conclusions of that book, and I wanted to place emphasis on a slightly different thread, which is the question of their, of their relationship to the state. And the fact, as Fran outlines in this book, in their relationship to the state, Sephardic Jews of Bordeaux set a template for French Jewry. And I just want to read um, the last paragraph of the book. Um, the rest of the Jews of Bordeaux joined with the Ashkenazim together for the first time. They undertook to complete the transformation of French Jewry. Despite the compromises they made with Judaism and their commitment to embrace France as their country and the French as their fellow citizens, the Jews of France continued to remain marginal men. Ironically, they became modern Muranos whose assimilation to their place of residence rested on a foundation of Jew Jewish separateness. To be sure, the legal coercion and the fear experienced in past centuries had disappeared. In their place, however, were a no less keenly felt social pressure and shame. The Sephardim of Bordeaux had successfully bequeathed their entire heritage to French Jewry. That, that is the final sentence of the book. It seems to me that this struggle that this book undertakes understanding the relationship between, let's say, Jews of different communities, legally uh, defined, culturally defined, historically defined, the struggle between a minority community and the state, the struggle between um, the desire for uh, integration and the, uh, the quest for distinction, those issues are still issues that the field of Sephardic studies is struggling with. And we are still struggling with that final point that she makes in the book, which is to consider and to make evident the way in which Sephardic Jewry offers to a larger nation, a larger, um, in often multicultural Jewish national community, uh, the way Sephardic Jewry offers them and these entities um, something important, something essential, something that changes the way we understand modern Jewish history as a whole. And it's quite remarkable that this insight made in Fran's um, typical, I think, narrative style, which I'll talk about in a second, this insight is made very modestly. This is not a programmatic agenda for the creation of the field of Sephardic studies. It is instead, like so much of Fran's work, it is firm. It is definitive. It is never negative. It is framed as positive, even when a historiographic intervention. It is, I would say, a characteristic mixture of ambition and modesty. And that is a style that I think has defined um, her writing, but also the mentorship she offers to others in the field. Now, some of the vocabulary that I just read from the Sephardic Jews of Bordeaux would, of course, change with time, especially the gendered um, language that we see in that book. Um, but before I move to her, her work on uh, the Alliance, I, I want to also, like Lisa did, touch on Fran's work on Zalkin Horowitz and also read a sentence, uh, not from the book, actually, but from the essay drawn from the book that appeared in a book that um, Fran edited with David Sorkin and David John, uh, Profiles in Diversity, Jews in a Changing Europe. And of Zalkin Horowitz in that book, I don't think the sentence is reproduced um, in the book itself. Fran writes this, his life provides a poignant example of one man's resolution of the charge of being an outsider, of being marginal to the society which molded his self-perceptions. Horowitz still speaks to the delicate and always precarious balance between the right to be equal and the freedom to be different. I see here continuity from the study of um, Jews of Bordeaux, that toggling between either an individual or an individual community and a larger whole a sense of struggle as a scholar with how to integrate individuation into a larger and always a Jewish as well as a French narrative. Here I will digress for a moment as it, by way of transition to Fran's work on the Alliance to say that uh, a couple of years ago I was 
trying to track down the history of a single woman teacher in the Alliance who was herself from Salonika uh, and went to teach in many, many schools across um, the Levant, including Morocco. Uh, her name was Suzanne Levy. And I wrote Fran, I don't remember what started the conversation, but I wrote to ask, have you read her writings? What do you think? There was something sort of sticky in the archive. And in response, Fran did two things that I remember well. One, she pointed me to some documentation. Um, all of us who have worked in the Alliance Archive can, can visualize this well, a handwritten document that you can only view on a terrible microfilm in the basement of the Allianz Archive, although now I understand it's, it's all changed, but at that time, so, so it was, um, without printing capacity. Um, but more importantly, so there was a concrete offer of a source, which I value very much, but much more importantly, she said, I remember that something was troubling about Suzanne Levy. She was a troubled figure. Now, I don't know how much earlier you had read those letters, but you had remembered not just the particularities of this woman's employment and her life and her experience as a teacher. You had remembered something about her spirit. And I went back. I had already read much of her letters and her husband's letters in trying to reconstruct her life. And I went back, and Fran was right. I had missed it. There was something, actually, this was a, um, a troubled woman who experienced trouble with her employers and crisis wherever she traveled. And it was a very short comment, but it was immensely insightful. And an insight that comes, as I think, um, Lisa, you said, from reading sources empathetically, reading them with knowledge and expertise, but also reading them for the human story they tell. And that is the very rare form of mentorship one receives, not just to be directed to a historical uh, source or moment, but to a truly deeper understanding of an individual. Now, Fran's work on uh, the women teachers of the Alliance and family in families in particular mark such a dramatic shift in certain respects from her earlier writings. There is a shift from an elite writings to rather more quotidian and intimate writings, including letters, a shift from men to women and also to adolescents, a, a transition from sources of commerce and uh, intellectual um, writings to texts of intimacy. Also, I think, a transition from communitarian history and biography to an intimate history of relationships and families and the kind of um, trans-regional relationships women maintain. But one of the things that strikes me is that in the face of these transitions and in the face of the dramatic shifts in the field of Sephardic studies that had emerged from the publication of Sephardic Jews of Bordeaux to her more recent work on the Alliance Women, there is still a repetition of theme. A transition, as I say, to women and away from certain sources and towards others, but an embrace of um, this same approach that she employed with her study of Zalkin Horowitz, with the Sephardic Jews of Bordeaux, that desire to uh, identify, to tease out this delicate, these are her words, precarious balance uh, between right to be equal and the freedom to be different. And I see that as a sustained thematic in her work that she has developed and maintained and refined and in a most impressive manner allowed to be elastic to accommodate and, as I said earlier, to indeed presage shifts in method, in historical theory, and in historiography while nonetheless uh, engaging this abiding human question through the course of her most impressive scholarly career. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for to all these wonderful contributions on this panel. And if I may be allowed, I shall say a few words myself. Uh, uh, I'll take the liberty to do so, giving myself the right to say. So, um, it's a great pleasure here, and I'd like to reminisce a little bit and then add a couple of um, comments. Uh, um, 
Of course, it starts uh, at Cambridge, and I met Fran when I was a graduate student at Harvard, and of course I was then moving towards uh, a dissertation topic uh, on the Alliance Israelite Universelle, and obviously entering the whole world of French Judaism. So, lo and behold, we met, and the rapport was immediate. We were on the same wavelength in terms of understanding some of the major trends, and of course, we also became good close friends. Um, and then, imagine my great delight years later, um, when after all her work in other uh, aspects of French Jewish history, Fran said, I'm getting interested in the women teachers of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, and let's talk about the archives and getting into them. And of course, this was really a wonderful development for me. And, and then I should really like to say there something about my appreciation of Fran's approach to that archive. Because that archive, which is incredibly rich, can be approached in so many ways. It can be done in an institutional framework. It can be done in a very um, sort of the politics of it. It can be done for study of like insight it shows on Muslim societies, and different perspectives, insights into French Jewry, insights into that whole world of Franco Judaism as it's evolving in very many different ways. And you know, it's it's incredibly rich. And I'm not sure we have yet exhausted all of its the ways that that can be mined. But I think Fran is unique, really, in her approach to that archive uh, from, from, from the perspective of many things that have been referred to here um, on the stress on the individual and also this deeply sensitive reading about the individuals involved in it. And they are not, but let me assure you, that is not an easy task in that archive. It is really tracing down little uh, pieces of paper and little incidental comments. And, because ultimately, the archive is not really about the intimate writings of these, of these people. It is really about a very stern organization and a central committee and wanting to hear on the employees about the work that is being done, the, uh, what the information they, they, they are going to give. Um, about uh, that they're going to provide for, about what's happening in, in that world and of course their great mission to transform and civilize these benighted Jews in uh, these benighted lands which was really and, and, and to, to move towards that and I think to tease out of that archive uh, the extraordinary amount of not only information but human information it was really quite remarkable and shows a great sensitivity uh, to the individual that a lot of people have been um, talking about here. And, and here then, however, I'd like to start from there and really observe something else, again alluded to, and that is the engagement with uh, um, emancipation and assimilation. Obviously, it starts with emancipation uh, with Fran, of course, the Jews of Bordeaux, like long story of French Jewry before the French Revolution and during the French Revolution. And the way, indeed, for a small community with some very strong leaders arguing on their own behalf in a very activist way um, and making their way through the very difficult world of the Ancien Regime into uh, the revolution itself, a, a kind of a process of slowly becoming more and more engaged in the emancipatory process. Um, and then we reach with that as the next logical conclusion, ultimate figure of French Jewish emancipation, Zalkin Horowitz, who, of course, as a lone individual, in some ways encapsulates all the vagaries of the emancipation story and the fact that indeed he participates in almost all of the debates and as an individual in some ways is a kind of straw in the wind of what will eventually become full-blown Franco-Judaism and the Jews of the Republic as a kind of a, a lone figure and also an immigrant no less um, that represents so much about what was going to happen there. And last but not least, in a different sense, the women teachers are all about emancipation. The women emancipating, 
themselves to a degree that until Fran had started looking at those teachers, nobody had really teased out how indeed these women, with the tools that had been given to them by the education, developed this extraordinary agency of their own. And instead of becoming just bureaucrats of this rather stern organization, became really um, active figures, contestatory figures, talking back to the indomitable, the rather awful Monsieur Bigard, who was uh, stern and chastised everybody at every single letter if he could, and they pushed back. And it is really a remarkable achievement to be able to push back, um, given, in fact, the entire trajectory of these women who came actually from North Africa, from places that you know were, were really very distant from the uh, city of lights, and you arrive there, and then there is this massive the figure Alsatian Jew of stern um, background, and they push back, they talk back, they argue, and they emancipated themselves in a very different way than, of course, the political emancipation we're talking about. But it really is about uh, what the French would say, prendre la parole. They take the word. They actually talk back. And in some ways, Zalkin Hurwitz talks back, right? And, and uh, I can see certain kind of trends in this particular way, but I think that it's very interesting to see a process of scholarship that starts with the Sephardi Jews on Bordeaux and now con is continuing with uh, these uh, remarkable figures and which is also contributing, a which will contribute and is contributing so much to, in some ways, the history of women uh, Jewish women in the modern world, uh, with the twists in the in the in in outside Europe that really uh, go into all kinds of different directions, and in a way that I think enriches and complicates our stories about the history of Jewish women and indeed gender history in general in the modern world. So, this is a remarkable corpus. I we all have looked into different perspectives of it and um, uh, thank you Fran for all your splendid achievements and for all your friendships and mentorship thank you do you want to say something huh? I think Fran you want to say something uh, a few words please here I really I really have prepared nothing and I I really I'm in awe of, of everything everyone said. I learned so much about who I was. <laughs> and the, what, you know, when you look back in retrospect on your life, you tend to take a thread or two threads. And I'm in awe that you all really, you know, understood not, I mean, the value you place on my work is, in my mind, higher than I certainly ever did. But I appreciate it and I'm grateful for it but also that you really got me in a way. And the fighting back and the threads and Sarah that you're, the whole thing, you know, once I gave a lecture very early on in my career at Brandeis um, and it was actually a, um, a, a round table of sorts and they gave me a chair that was teetering and I was going like this back and forth and I thought this is a metaphor for what interests me in Jewish history. <laughs> that, that yes, the right to be different, the, the freedom to be equal. And, and I mean, I, I'm truly in awe that you all did spend so much time and gave it so much thought and helped me see myself in a new light. Um, a couple of other just little points I wanted to make since um, age gives me this uh, freedom, I guess. <laughs> um, I just love the fact that this panel, bracketing you, Aaron, but you're, you're the moderator, <laughs> that the panel is all women. And the AJS is celebrating 50 years. Um, I attended the, not the first one, I was in um, Bordeaux on a Fulbright that year doing research for my dissertation. But the next year, so 49 years worth of AJS. And um, 49 years ago when I attended AJS, um, I won't say who it was, but someone who was teaching at Brandeis at the time came up, patted me on the head and said, my dear Francis, what are you doing here? Um, not realizing that, well, I was getting a PhD in the very department that he was part of, but it was just unlikely that a woman would be here at AJS 49 years ago. So to look and see this incredible panel, and I think you will all agree 
that bracketing the substance and the topic, just the way you all were able to express yourselves, the sensitivity, the understanding, the warmth, the love, the affection that I receive from all of you. I am so grateful, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and thank you. And this one is, he, he understated our connection when we got together that first time. We, it was like a soulmate, and we've been soulmates ever since. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.